Hi and welcome to the second part of chapter 17 on animals. So we get animals part one and now we're diving straight into animals part two. So again, this one chapter is going to be worth two lectures um, because there's so much involved. So let's go straight back into it and uh, continue with animals part two. All right, so the next animal that we have is the round worms or the phylum nematoda. Now, we've already seen some worms before. Remember, we had the flatworms, the platyhelminthes, we had the, the uh, annelid worms, or the segmented worms, and now we're moving on to the nematodes, the round worms. Now, nematodes are, again, a little bit different than the flatworms that we saw. The flatworms that we saw are the flat worms, like your flukes. The segmented worms have those tiny little segments, like your earthworms. Um, and then finally, you have your round worms, like your nematodes, which are going to be your, just basically, your almost very simple looking worm. Now they do have this thin like cuticle wrapped around them. Now if you guys remember back to the uh, fungus video, we actually saw nematodes already when it, when it came to the nematode uh, infecting fungus. So these actually went and ate these little nematode worms. Now you think, oh poor little nematode, he's getting eaten by all these funguses. Um, yeah, these nematodes actually do a lot of damage themselves. So not all of them are bad, but some of them can cause some pretty nasty diseases, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Remember how I told you that some of those worms depend on mammals to survive? Yeah, we're going to learn about a couple of those species. But first, let's talk about some worms that we would have had in our lab, uh, these vinegar eels. And these vinegar really cool stuff, guys. All right, so let's look at one of them who is just fascinating. In fact, this was the star of a video that went viral not too many years ago. Um, some deep sea fishermen pulled up a basket star and a basket, sorry, this is a little bit different than a, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is going to be, oh, one of those round worms that are actually like super gross and infectious. Um, so you think, oh, you know, poor little nematode, he got eaten by the fungus. No, no. Yeah, these guys do some nasty things. Um, if they do actually infect you, they can cause all sorts of different things. Um, they can actually infect you via mosquito bites or flies or biting flies. And so uh, they get transmitted that way into you. And then they cause all sorts of really nasty things like lymphatic fluid buildup. So your lymphatic system is like a drainage system. It's kind of like a cleansing system for your body. And sometimes that it has like excess fluid. Well, if you're infected by one of these, you have so much excess fluid, it actually causes elephantitis. So elephantitis, yeah, like the elephant man. Again, it's this like giganticism of your tissues and your, it's a swelling of your lymphatic fluid, um, which is really, really gross. And so you can see this right here. It's not only just gross, but it's painful. Can you imagine your skin and your muscles and your cells being stretched out because you have all this excess fluid in your system? Not good. So, and it's, it's caused by a little, just an infection of this roundworm. Um, so you don't really typically think of worms as something you have to worry about. Yeah, like the tapeworms, like those intestinal worms, just like this guy, they actually live inside of mammals. Um, and this is how they survive and they cause us a lot of harm. We're going to burn a little bit another one too, the, uh, the guinea worm. The guinea worm is in, say, third world countries uh, or places of poverty like India that has, doesn't have like super clean water and they have a lot of, um, poverty and so they don't have access to these clean water sources so the pollution and the runoff and the waste and the water is all kind of like the same source so say you were living in India and you got a sore on your foot and you're like oh it really hurts what am I going to do you don't have a sink you don't have running water so you go to a local little pond and you go and you rinse your foot off you wash your foot off well what you don't realize is that open sore actually was the adult version of the guinea worm and when you bring it into the water, it releases its larvae. So you have this blister that you wash inside the water, which opens up and then releases the worm, which releases its larvae. The larvae are gonna float around in the water until they infect a smaller organism, like one of these little water fleas right here, which is just an arthropod. Uh, that little water flea would say be swimming in the water and accidentally might get drank by the guy. Again, they don't have access to this fresh water. Be thankful for where you live. And so the same water that they're bathing in is the same water that they're drinking out of. So they're infecting themselves again or infecting another individual without even knowing it. So then they drink the water. The, the adult grows up here inside the intestine of the mammal. Mm-hmm. 
and then eventually it works its way all the way down to the foot causing that little sore. The person goes, oh, I have a sore on my foot. Let me go to the water and wash it off. And the cycle continues. So again, they're drinking the water, which makes them infected. They rinse their foot off in said water, which infects the water, which then they then drink, which then infects them again. Ah, it's just this perpetual series of growth that's going on in some of these really infected waters. So this is why you don't drink water out of streams and rivers and stuff. If you can, obviously they're going to die if they don't. So they don't really have a choice. They don't get to go to, to, you know, the store and buy a Fiji water. It's not how that works. So unfortunately for them, this is, this is just a, a way of life and, and something that they have to deal with because of, of their situation. Uh, so guinea worm, again, is this infected water nematode that swims around just infecting people. It causes really, really nasty, painful sores. It's, it's just all sorts of bad. Um, but it's how the worm has survived for a really long time and, and does quite well this way. Ugh. All right, let's talk about a phylum that's a little less gross, shall we? Let's talk about the echinoderms or echinodermata. Um, these are going to be your spiny skin organisms. So echinodermata means spiny skinned or hedgehog skin. Um, so these are going to be your sea stars, your sea cucumbers, your sand dollars, and your sea urchins. So these are pretty much all marine organisms. Um... They're going to be enclosed by a exoskeleton, um, but they don't have a soft inside body. They really don't have much on their inside body. In fact, they have what's called a water vascular system. So remember that vascular system that we talked about, the open versus closed, right? That confined, that um, fluid that's circulating all of our body. These guys don't have any of that fluid. They actually use water itself and just do most things through simple diffusion. So they're diffusing out the water via their gills. They're diffusing out these, um, you know, the oxygen to all their tissues and stuff like that just via the simple water systems, water vascular system that they have. Um, also known as like a hydrostatic skeleton. Like they're bringing in water and, right, that's pumping them up so that they can actually have that skeleton, that support system. Um, besides their exoskeleton, they really don't have much going on on the insides. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, the adults are going to be radially symmetrical okay so just like those cnidarians we talked about the adults are radial in symmetry okay so these are the only two phylums pretty much that have it specifically when it comes to the echinoderms they're known as pentaradial or radial only five ways so think about a sea star you can cut them in almost any direction well about five directions to get that mirror image on both sides um when it comes to the sand dollars and the sea cucumbers it's a little bit more like round like actual radial um, but their larvae, their little babies, are bilateral. So they do go back and forth from the bilateral symmetry to the radial symmetry. Um, so that might be, I don't know, might be a test question. How could it be bilateral and radial? Well, the juvenile are bilateral, the adults are radial. So something to keep in mind. Um, but these guys are just far too interesting and far too different from each other um, to not watch a video on them. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to watch the video on Shape of Life Echinoderm. Just amazing, amazing videos. I hope you guys are enjoying them as much as I always have. Um, so yeah, sea stars are really good at the feeding. We saw in the video how they can project their stomach out of their bodies and digest something outside and then <laughs> slurp it back up. These guys are just crazy. Um, this is a picture of a sun star right here. You can see it has many more arms than just five. So there are some species that have uh, more arms than just five. But it's actually feasting on, what you can't see right here is, um, that looks like a little penguin. So I'm pretty sure this guy just caught and ate a penguin, which is insane. He's either eating the carcass or he's really good at what he does. Um, but yeah, really amazing feeders, these guys. Uh, this guy's cool. This is a basket star. So this is a deep sea sea star um, that doesn't have five arms. It has many, many arms, and the arms itself have little branches of them. So it's called a basket star because it almost looks like a woven little basket. They also usually flip their arms upwards, creating that basket shape because they're looking for food that's floating by with their arms. They're going to try to grab it and, and um, bring it towards their mouth. 
so these guys are really super interesting and in fact even went viral a few years ago there's a deep sea fisherman that pulled one up and on his deck the arms were moving and cleaving and doing all this kind of stuff and everybody was like oh my god that's an alien and every marine biologist everywhere was like dude that's a basket star like calm down um but very much alien looking so again not all have perfect radial symmetry um, in this case, we would just basically bisect uh, the, uh, the central disc right there in the middle to get that radial symmetry. But again, modified, still uh, absolutely an echinoderm. Classic examples of echinoderms, these are sand dollars and sea urchins, very closely related. Sand dollars typically have, especially the ones we have off of our coast, are purple, just like these, and they have those little spines. You're like, wait a minute, I've seen sand dollars. Um, they're white and soft. That's because that's their test. That's the only thing that's left when they die. And then the rolling around in the sand as they're getting washed up on shore actually knocks each and every one of those little urchin spines off or the sand dollar spines off. So that when you actually, actually find the sand dollar, it is that clean, white, soft, because that's the test. That's their exoskeleton. That's the only thing that remains. But normally they are purple. They are fuzzy. They do have these tiny little purple spines all over them. And they can move each and every one of those spines independently. So they actually stand themselves up and that's how they feed. They wait for the current to kind of bring food to them and then they move the food with these little spines towards the center, towards their little mouth. Um, really fascinating stuff. This is a purple sea urchin, strongly ascentus purpuratus, found off of our coast. Um, not great for kelp forests. So when we have a big healthy ecosystem, there are predators that will eat the urchins. When we don't have a big healthy ecosystem, there's no predators to eat those urchins. So the urchins go crazy on the kelp forest because they eat kelp. So then they'd be eating all of this kelp that's there and now all of a sudden all the kelp is gone and that big beautiful healthy kelp forest is also gone too. And now you lose all the species that depended on that kelp forest. So the fishes, the sharks, the shrimp, uh, the crabs, the snails, Anything that would live in that kelp forest now can't because there's no more kelp forest because these little buggers get in too high uh, numbers and then they just start killing everything. It's called an urchin barren. And it's called a barren because they eat everything. So that beautiful forest is now gone. It's like deforestation from an animal. Yeah, not, not necessarily a good thing. But when the ecosystem's healthy, everything's balanced and it's okay. We have just removed the top predators like sheephead. It's a type of fish that's really big and people like to fish it or otters. So both of those things used to eat the um, sea urchin, but we keep removing them and therefore the ecosystems are kind of out of whack because of us. Once again, just ruining things. Ah, here's a fun one. On a lighter note, let's learn a little bit about the sea pig. Thanks to our good friend Z Frank in our True Facts videos. Gotta love those true facts videos. All right, guys, moving on to our very, very last phylum. These are the chordates. So this is where we fall in. This is where pretty much any animal you can probably name, just right off the top of your head, are probably going to be under the chordates. So you're like elephants and zebras and lions and tigers and sharks and fish, all under chordates. Okay, so we're going to talk about what makes chordates such an awesome phylum, such a diverse phylum. Um, even though it's actually relatively pretty small compared to things like the arthropod phylum and the mollusca phylum, we do have some pretty amazing things here in Chordata, including ourselves. So we are falling under the phylum Chordata. All right, so let's start with some of these characteristics. One, all chordates have what's called a notochord and a dorsal hollow nerve cord. Essentially, this is on its way to being a backbone. So we're under the Right now we're under the phylum chordata. We specifically are under the subphylum vertebrata. So that's your actual vertebrae, that backbone that you have with those nerves. That's all going to be considered under the vertebrata. So the notochord and the dorsal hollow nerve cord are kind of like on its way to developing into a actual vertebrae, but they're not quite there yet. Um, we do all have a post anal tail. Um, so past our butt, we do have a little tail and you're like, we don't have a tail. Yes, you do have a tail. It's called our tailbone. So most mammals have a tail. Our tail has been reduced to a, um, sorry, most mammals, most chordates have a tail. Our tail has been reduced to a very, very tiny, just little tail bone. Um, but they are still there. So all of them do still have that. 
And finally, we all have pharyngeal gill slits. So basically, here we kind of had these like gills to help us breathe while we were going through development in that amniotic fluid inside of our parents. So inside of our parents, inside of our moms, <laughs> not of our dads, that'd be weird. Um, so again, we all have gills at one point. We're like, wait, we don't have gills in a tail. Yes, you do. You have gills in a tail. Of course, we lose those gills eventually when we develop and we develop things like lungs. Um, but in the beginning, yes, we absolutely do. And so this is something that all chordates actually share. So we are going to watch a video on the shape of life chordates because you just, you got to, you got to round it out with another video. So hope you guys enjoy. All right, that was the Cordae's video. Thank you, Shape of Life. Seriously, so fascinating. All right, so looking at a simple chordate body plan, um, again, you have your notochord right here, you have your dorsal hollow nerve cord. Again, essentially, these are working together to form things like our nervous system and our spinal cord. Um, we have our pharyngeal gill slits right here, which would be near our pharynx, um, and then our post anal tail. Again, this is very simplified. This is kind of like a general characteristic for more simple organisms like the lancelet. So the lancelet um, is going to be this one of the first chordates. Uh, it's on its way to having those things that we have being in the subphylum vertebrata. So these are not quite there. Um, but small, very simple organisms right here, they have a mouth up on top, they have these little tentacles that they feed with, um, and they're gonna bury themselves in the sediment, just kind of feed just like so, um, those little suspension feeders. So again, a lancelet, very simple type of chordate, kind of tricky, but we're not going to try to trick you guys on the exam. So if you don't really understand this, you can always come take my marine biology class. All right, let's get into some fish diversity. Um, we have an amazing variety of fishes on the planet, things like agnathans, which are our jawless fishes. And you can see those two right here, the hagfish and the lamprey. We have the cartilaginous fishes, the chondric, these right here, which are your sharks, your skates, your rays. And then you have your uh, osteichthys, which are your bony fish right here, which you can think of like your tunas, your marlins, your um, billfish, stuff like that, your goldfish at home. Um, those are all going to be under the bony fishes. So starting with the hagfishes, this is part of the group Agnatha, remember the jawless fishes. These are only marine, and they do not have a jaw, and you're like, wait, they don't have a mouth? They do have a mouth, they don't have a jaw with a hinge, like, that's a jaw. They just have a very simple um, little mouth. These guys are scavengers. They do live in the deep sea and they are blind. Essentially what they're doing is they're sniffing out carcasses that have fallen down to the bottom and then they're going to scavenge those carcasses. They have a very unique predator uh, deterrent mechanism that most other fishes don't have. Along their body right here, they have these tiny little slime glands and they produce this slime and when they release it, it actually reacts with the seawater and creates this like crazy thick molasses -y goo you can stretch and pull out like this and we're talking the hagfish are pretty small like this but a single hagfish can actually produce up to like five gallons of slime within within minutes like it's insane how much slime that one of these little tiny guys can actually produce um, via these slime glands so if you were a predator and you're trying to eat one of these hagfish they can essentially you know you bite down on them and then they release that slime gland, and then then you have like molasses in your mouth and you try and you chew and you can't, and then the hagfish is going to be able to get away because you have this really thick, nasty goo in your mouth. Um, super gross. So that's what you can see right here. You can see them pulling this apart, you're stretching it apart, physically holding it with your hand and separating it. Like, and it still won't pry apart. That's how thick and viscous this slime is. So really crazy, gross stuff, but super interesting. Thank you, hagfish. And again, I always include videos and stuff if you guys want to see more of them. We just don't have the time to show you every video I want to. But you, luckily, you guys have time. You can always look up this stuff up and Google it at home. All right, getting on to our jawed fishes, right? These are your cartilaginous fishes and your bony fishes, right? So we have a couple different groups. No, you do not need to be able to identify these. Just know that all these fishes that you can uh, recognize are the, you know, jawed fishes. Uh, we have the cartilaginous fishes, the sharks, the skates, the rays. We have the ray fin fishes, um, 
things like your tunas, your billfishes and stuff, and then finally your lobe fin fishes um, right here like that lungfish. And again, you do not really need to know the difference between these fishes, um, just that they all fall under the chordate, um, the phylum. But I can't not talk about my favorite group in the world, the cartilaginous fishes. The sharks, the skates, and the rays are absolutely fantastic. I love them so much. Sharks are my favorite thing in the world. Um, so of course I'm going to show you guys a video on some of these mobulas, which are really, really cool as well. So your sharks, your skates, and your rays, um, these are all cartilaginous fishes. They are called cartilaginous fishes because they have cartilage skeletons. Like your ear is made out of cartilage, it's kind of flexible material. Same thing with their bones, which is why we never find any shark bones. The only thing we find of sharks are their teeth, right? The hard teeth material that we actually see millions and millions of years later, where the rest of the skeleton is completely gone because it was made of cartilage. Um, oh, and then I'm going to show you guys this video real quick on these uh, mobulus. Fascinating mobulas, and I love them so much, and they're so gorgeous. All right, um, moving on to the rayfin fishes. This is probably any fish that you can probably mention, like the tunas, your goldfish at home. Um, pretty much all of them are going to be under the rayfin fishes, like the halibut, sarcastic fringe head, um, all sorts of different fishes like that. Um, and again, you do not really need to be able to recognize these, but just maybe understand the differences between the groups. And that's all that we can't test you on all of this stuff. So, um, oh, here's a cool one the oarfish. So this is actually what is believed to be the reason that people think that sea serpents exist and sea snakes and these big sea monsters. Because yes, this is a fish that's like 40 feet long or 30 feet long or however long he is. I think maybe that's only about 25 feet. Um, but it's massive and they do have these kind of like these dorsal spines that stick up. So it almost looks like they have this like crazy spike mohawk, but they're not dangerous. Um, they're just, they just happen to get really, really big. And so people would see them back in the day and be like, oh my God, there's a sea serpent. It's going to attack our boat. That actually was believed to be an oarfish. So just like the manatees, you know, were believed to be mermaids and stuff like this is where people understood mermaids to be, to come from. Same kind of thing with the oarfish. This is where we got that whole idea of sea serpents coming from the oarfish, which is an actual true fish, which is still out there today. It's pretty cool. Uh, your lobe fin fishes, um, one of the classic examples of that would be this lungfish, and it is called a lungfish because it can <gasps> kind of take a breath, which is super weird. Um, so if you want to, you can absolutely check out this cool video right here, but these are going to be your um, lobe fin fishes, also like your coelacanth, which were believed to be extinct like a thousand years ago, but then they totally caught one um, a couple years ago, or maybe it was like 10, 20 years ago at this point, but they thought it was extinct. Um, a thousand years ago. Now, evolutionary time, a thousand years ago, is not a long time. So people are always like, oh, well, if you can find the coelacanth, which was thought to be extinct, why can't you find a megalodon? You know? No. Megalodons were extinct like 65 million years ago. Not a thousand years ago. 65 million years ago. A long time. So no, I hate to break it to you. Um, but no, that movie Meg, it could not be true. And what a terrible movie. It was such, it was based on such a great book. If you want to go read a good book, read the book, um, Meg. The movie, The Meg was terrible, but you know, if you want to go see, if you want to read a good book, go read that one. All right. So moving away from fishes, moving on to amphibia. So now we're in the class amphibia. Um, these are going to be your frogs, your salamanders, and any of your little amphibians. Um, so here's a variety of different amphibians that we have here, um, including salamanders and stuff like that. These guys are all going to be really dependent on water. So unfortunately, all amphibians kind of on the planet are hurting right now because we've polluted most of their water sources. Um, we've developed over rivers and lakes and streams and stuff where they used to live. And so it's really actually kind of sad that all these, that these amphibians are kind of taking a huge hit right now. Um, once again, just because of us, because they have such a need for water, like they need to be near it constantly. Unlike say reptiles, which don't need to necessarily live near water. Most of these amphibians absolutely do. And therefore, you know, we've polluted the water that they, the little water that they do have. Um, and, uh, and we've developed over the rest of it. So poor amphibians, man, poor amphibians. Amphibians do go through a lifestyle change. They do lay their eggs in the water and then eventually develop into tadpoles as they're developing into the actual adult stage. This should not be shocking to you guys. Hopefully you know that amphibians do have tadpoles. 
unfortunately, during those developmental stages, sometimes things happen. Um, sometimes they can actually get infected by other organisms. Remember that the nematode that does some of the infections? Well, there are some of these flatworms that can actually infect these frogs as well, causing these basically mutations. And so you can see all here, these are underdeveloped limbs and legs, and so they're not going to be able to survive because of these mutations. Um, not just that, but they're also really sensitive to pollutants. So it's not just a flatworm that could actually infect them, but like pollutants themselves could cause these mutations to the point where now they have extra limbs or they're missing limbs and that's going to affect their actual survival rates. So really sad that these frogs are kind of taking it, you know, from every direction. It's just really bad. So save your local frogs, be nice to them. Don't pollute your waters. Be good to frogs. Reptiles, moving on to the class Reptilia. These are going to be your snakes, your uh, alligators, your crocodiles, uh, lizards, stuff like that. These guys are not dependent on things like water. Of course, they're dependent on things like water to live, but they can live farther away from water. These guys do not have tadpoles as their reproductive method. They just you know, lay eggs and have little babies that are actually developed as they come out of their eggs. Um, Notice in your reptile diversity that we see birds here and you're like, wait a minute. Yes, birds, which we learned in the evolution lecture, birds are just evolved dinosaurs, just like lizards are. So it's pretty crazy to think that little birds like that chicken maybe in your front yard or in your backyard in your chicken coop is actually a dinosaur. But fascinating. That's, and that's how evolution works. And that's how we got all of these different organisms is through evolution. Right? Just everyone evolved over and over again and after time and time and time, generation after generation. So now we have this really, really diverse planet with all sorts of really cool organisms. And not just one. It'd be super boring if the whole Earth was populated by just one type of organism. But through evolution, we were able to get many, 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 many more. So, ah, this is living in an amniotic egg. So these reptiles lay amniotic eggs. And you can see this is little... Um, basically developing embryo right here, the shell on the outside, you have all your nutrients and your little yolk sacs to help provide nutrition for the egg as it develops. Um, you guys do not need to know anything more about this. I'm not going to test you on the structure about it. Just know that the developing embryo develops inside an amniotic egg. Ah, getting on to the last class, the class of mammalia. So this includes us as well as many other different organisms. Um, now, mammals are typically giving live birth, but that's not the only way mammals can do it. Um, and again, there's going to be lots of different characteristics that separate the mammals out. You guys don't really need to know this, but we are going to see a little video on how mammals reproduce and just the differences in the varieties of them because you think, okay, as us humans, we just have live birth. Like, we just have birth to a live baby. But not all of them do it, including the kangaroos, the marsupials, and the duck-billed platypus who actually lays an egg. And you're like, no mammals lay eggs. And here comes a duck-billed duck platypus like, hold my drink. I'm going to show you, I'm going to prove you wrong kind of thing. So we're going to watch a real quick video on how mammals can reproduce differently. All right, guys, moving on. Here are some of those marsupials that we just learned about in their, uh, in the video. And you can see right here, these are, these are, you know, birds, babies, but they're not quite able to survive on their own. So that's again, why they're going to keep them here in this little marsupial pouch to help them develop, to keep them safe, to keep them protected until they can actually survive truly on their own, on their own. Um, so we have, again, some difference between live birth and marsupial births. Again, these are just kind of common animals if you want to look at either one of these categories. Just some examples for you guys. No, we're not going to test you on super, like, I'm not going to show you an animal and be like, what is this one? What kind of birth does it give? No, I'm not going to do any of that. But just to understand kind of some of the differences between mammals, because even though we all kind of look similar, um, we're slightly different in some of these major ways sometimes. Uh, and with that, I will end my lecture for all of chapter 17 on our animals. Again, thanks for sticking with me. It was a very long lecture, but I really appreciate it. And hopefully you guys have found this stuff really, really interesting and informative because there are a lot of different animals out there, not just your dogs and your cats that you really should care about because they're all unique and they've all spent a long time getting here um, via this evolution. And it, we just, it's not our planet. It's all of our planet. And so we should, we should be nice to them and, and fair to them. So keeping things like 
marine protected areas, keeping things like rainforest and natural preserves. It's all really, really important because it's not just the animals you see every day that you should care about. It's really, it's all the animals, um, including the little gross ones. So it's really important. Anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you guys very soon um, for chapter 18. Okay.